Today, I want to talk about the power to overcome. If you've been in church long enough, you know what it's like to come to Jesus. And um, I remember my first encounter with Jesus as a kid and pay no attention to the men moving the cooking show over here. I told you I was going to cook today. This could either go really well or we could burn the church down. How many people remember their first encounter with Jesus? You came to Jesus and you would, you would do anything. If they asked you to go on a mission trip to Tibet, you'd go. If they asked you to go and scale a mountain and preach Jesus from the top of it, you'd go. It was like this unbelievable faith, this unbelievable, you felt this newness. Anybody ever have a new car or at least your first car that you purchased, even if it was used a little bit, um, and you drive it off and you're just like, it's pristine. How many people remember that first ding you got at the parking lot in the stop and shop? How that feels. And you're like, it's ruined, that's it. How many people, have you ever had a new car or you knew somebody who had a new car the day the new car smell left the building? You know, and then a week later, maybe you smell a little hint of it, and then all of a sudden you get Chinese food, you bring it home in your car, it's all over. And that's kind of like how it is when we get saved, isn't it? You have this euphoria, you have this newness, you feel like you've been delivered, you feel so free, and then you get the first ding, and then you get the first problem, and then you have the first failure and the first sin. And I think it doesn't help that we have a, a form of Christian culture in our churches that well, depends on where you went, right? I mean, you know, you would come to the altars and, 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 then, and then we would preach messages about, okay, if you could just read your Bible, if you could just pray, if you could just do this, if you could just do that, you know, the list of to-dos, if you could just go on a missions trip, if you could just give more, if you could just do that, you'll be good. And you'll, and, and, but what happens is this, when you, when you try and prove to God that he could trust you, when you try and prove to God why he should take you back, you, you wind up doing it by works and not by faith, and, and then you fall again, and then you have, you have that gut-wrenching feeling of what it is to fail God, and then you feel like you have to work your way back and work your way back and work your way back, and, and I've been saved since I've been 12 years old, and uh, I could tell you that I've picked up some bad habits along the way which have given me a, a wrong view of God. And we've been told if we could just read the Bible, if we could just pray, if we could just do Christian things, if we could go to an accountability group, if we could, if we could do A, B, and C, you'll have freedom. And uh, I'm going to ask you a question, and you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you in this building are still dealing with things that you do habitually? Whether it's uh, a loose tongue, the way you speak, the way you think or things you do, and then you try to overcome it, and you try and do the right thing, but you wind up after like, you know, four or five weeks of saying, God, I'm never going to do it again, you do it again. And, and I feel like um, the Lord is, is, has, has just turned me on to that book, Gospel by J.D. Greer, and, and as I was reading it, it's like almost like sermon illustrations came to my mind. And today, I, I want to I offer you something from the Lord you know, not just about how, you know, how to address sin, but how to overcome it. And really what it's a matter of, it's, it's a matter of choice. So r right here, I have my very own cooking show. Everybody welcome to the Pastor Dom cooking show. <laughs> now yesterday I went to 7-Eleven and I got the uh, taquito. See what's in this mystery bag. I got chicken wings. I got the cheeseburger, whatever this thing is. And then I got a, I got a slice of pizza, and the guy's like, hey, you want it? They're, they're two for four. And he almost wouldn't let me walk out of the 7-Eleven until I, I did it. Look at that. Now, these haven't been refrigerated since yesterday, I got these at 7-Eleven in an open area where you grab your own tongs, breathe your COVID over the elements, and pick something to eat. And this represents the sin and the temptation that we all go through. 
It's kind of like, you know, we have the choice. And, and have you ever been really hungry and you knew you were going out for a great meal later on, but you chose to eat something subpar and it ruined your appetite for later on? See, look at this pizza. This is not even right. He should have paid me to take this off his hands. And yet Josh, when I came to church, he's like, mmm, all that looks good. Well, apparently he can get dysentery. And it's funny because sin, sin kind of looks good in the, in the immediate, right? It's like an immediate return. How, how many of you, just by a show of hands, you've ever eat, eaten or ate anything? And it, it, it looked good and it felt good, but then eventually you wound up... Uh, uh, sitting on the throne for the rest of the day. Come on, Emma, raise your hand if you've ever eaten something. And it's like make, it's like white castles. They feel good going down, not so good coming out. And I think we all know what it's like. And, and this is so much like sin. Now, a little bit more on that later. But the power to overcome sin. What would you do if you knew that you didn't have to eat this, but you could eat something that's fresh? Like right here, I've got some chicken cutlets that I pounded out for you last night. I got some seasoned flour. I got some egg wash. I got some butter. I got all these different things. I'm going to make you some chicken francais today. I'm actually going to show you how to do it right here at Bell Rose. Now, how many people know you could eat this or you could choose to eat something better? And when you realize it's not your works or your, 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 your strength, right? Paul says, in my weakness, he makes me strong. It's, it's in knowing that God is better. It's, it's in knowing that he loves you unconditionally. It helps me say no to this and yes to this. All of these fresh ingredients and the ability to cook it yourself represents God's love. All of this represents sin and our own doing. So we could try and prove to God that we'll never do it again, or we could choose to accept his grace and be clothed in his righteousness. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Isn't that awesome? I hope we can lift the veil on some of the lies that the enemy has told you. We'll get to the show in a few moments, because I'm cooking for Peter and Andrew over there. <laughs> that's like cooking for the New York Times, by the way. Uh, and uh, we're going to make it happen. But today we want to talk about the power to overcome. Are you excited to take the journey? This would be a great service to share. Please help me share. I wasn't able to share as Dominic Cotignola. I have to figure out. I was, he was making me share as Belrose. So if you could help me out, make sure the sermon gets out, and I'll share it after service. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to preach your word, which is my worship to you this morning. I thank you, Lord, I'm speaking for an audience of one, and you're going to hear these words, and then you're going to take them from heaven, and you're going to move in, amongst your people by your Holy Spirit, and Lord, that everything that you want to say to them is going to be said. I thank you, Lord, that it's not just going to resonate in this room, but it's, it's going to speak to people all over the world, and especially those that are watching right now. God, I pray that they would be leaning in, glued to their phones and their devices, and even in this room, that God, we would we would have an answer for something we've been struggling with for a while. That you bless us in Jesus' name. And to you be all the glory and the power and the praise forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. So I remember when I first got saved, it was awesome. I felt new. I felt fresh. Exciting. It's so exciting to me. I was fresh. As a kid, praying at the top of the, the steps when I was young, I'll never forget my first encounter with God. This is before I even came to Jesus. I used to be afraid. Um, Superman 2, I still get afraid when I see it. General Zod, he was creepy. We lived in Queens. That was close enough. Metropolis was New York City. And in, in the daytime, General Zod was trying to take over the planet Houston. And at nighttime, he was looking for... Jarell, the son of Jarrell Kalel, in the city, which was Manhattan. My dad was a police officer, worked overnight, and I found myself always being afraid that General Zod was going to fly through my window, whisk me away, and tell me, step and kneel before Zod. Little did I know, as I would lose my hair and grow a beard, Matt would call me General Zod for the rest of my life. <laughs> but I remember being a scared little kid. 
and not wanted to go to bed. In fact, I would army crawl my way into my mother's room and eventually stand over her bed like this, breathing over her as she was breathing. And she would wake up in the middle of the night, grab me by the jugular because she didn't know if I was a robber or somebody else and throw me back in the bed. And I remember they would always have to deal with me being scared. I'll never forget. You know, my mother used to pray that prayer that we all used to pray when we were young. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. <laughs> How many people know that is the worst thing you could pray over a child? But nonetheless, our, that's all we knew back then, right? Now, that wasn't my mother's fault, but that was just a prayer we all said. And my mother, you know, she was on her own spiritual journey, and she had a heart for the Lord. So it's funny, even though we weren't yet saved, it was like God was calling us. And I remember one night, my mother was downstairs, my dad was probably working, and it was one of those nights where she was fed up with the fact that we wouldn't go to sleep. Any parents ever go through the, I'm fed up that my kids aren't going to sleep moment? Come on. So she was fed up as a parent, and I can understand that, but it was one of, those, one of those nights I had to tough it out on my own. Like, she didn't have the equity of time to stay with me until I could fall asleep. And I remember... I knew enough about God from going to church and praying those little prayers. In my childlike faith, I cried out to Jesus, and I will never forget it. I had such a peace come over me. It was so real. It's how I know God is real, because every time I doubt him, I go back to that moment in my room in Middle Village, Queens, when my dad was at work, when my mother was in, the, in, in, and I prayed, and there was a peace that I never had with my mother by my side, with my dad by my side, with my grandparents by my side. There was a peace that came over me, and I, it was almost like the Holy Spirit had ministered to me. Now that I know the presence of God, and I've experienced the Lord himself, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt in my elementary school mind that I had encounter with God. And it was like there were a couple of times I remember where I was so scared for whatever reason that I felt the peace of God which transcended all understanding. God, my heart. I didn't know it then, but now I know it. Any, anything ever happened to you in your life where something happened to you and you didn't know what it was, but now that you're older and wiser and more saved, you know, come on now, it, you understand it because you know the word, and it was God working on me. I had a childlike faith, and in Matthew 8, 1 through 5, the disciples asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus said in verse 3, he says in 18, Matthew 18, 3, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like a little, little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, childlike faith, I want you to write that down, childlike faith. I, I, I feel like, you know, now that I'm in my mid-40s and, and I, you know, I, I've lived life and experienced ministry, it's like you get jaded, don't you? Life happens. The world happens. Especially the world that we live in. And you forget what it was like to be a child. One of my favorite movies is Big. You guys remember the movie Big? Where, uh, where, where a 12-year-old becomes an adult but yet he's still a child, and then everybody that he comes in contact with, they see this boisterous youth. And you see, when you're a child and you have childlike faith, you're free from pride. You're free from covetedness. Well, generally, unless you want your brother's toys. You're free from ambition. When you're a child, you're totally dependent on your caregivers. You're totally dependent on your parents. You're totally dependent. You know, Luke, when he comes to, when he, when he, when he, when he finishes dinner, He'll ask Rachel, what's for dinner tomorrow? He found out yesterday that Rachel was making pork roast, and his immediate response was, huh? And to his surprise, and this is a world record because he hates pork roast, he actually said, Mom, this is actually pretty good pork roast. See, Luke is totally dependent on the fact that he, he, he doesn't have to go shopping. He hates shopping. We told him the other day we had to go to BJ's to pick up some things. He's like, we got to go to BJ's? Oh, can I stay in the car? No. And Luke, Luke will walk around like a grumpy old man when you take him shopping. So Luke is totally dependent on the fact that we are going to provide for him. Rebecca is trusting it's funny, yesterday I was teaching Rebecca a magic trick, and she was hanging on every word I said. And she believed it, too. She actually thought I made the cup disappear, and I was very surprised she didn't hear it hit the floor underneath the table. <laughs> but she believed me, 
And then I taught her the trick, and I said, remember, a magician never shares their trick. And she's like, well, why are you sharing it with me, Daddy? I said, because you're my assistant, and tomorrow we're going to saw Luke in half. <laughs> but how many people, when you look at children, you start, to, you start to remember what it was like to have that faith in God that was just immovable. I want that back. Because I think that that translates into us being able to say no to sin. It, it, you know, I think we, 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 we have battle scars. We have life that happens. We, we get hurt by people. And all of a sudden, we associate how people are with God. And we forget what it was like to trust every word he said and to really enjoy his presence and to really just, really, God, by your grace I'm saved? We almost come into a salvation by works, rather a salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And we spend our life trying to work against temptation rather than receiving the grace that only he can give to cause you to live in holiness. I was saved at the age of 13, 12 years old. I was around Luke's age. What a fantastic time in my life. And, 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 and I remember, come on, you all remember when you, uh, you accepted Jesus and life happens and then we have relationship with God and and it gets a little weathered. You know, think about the church in Revelation. He said, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. And he says, if you want to get back with me, go and do the things you did at first. And the things that we did at first, I want you to think about when you first fell in love with Jesus. When you first, oh, when you first felt that feeling where you were saved and set free. You accepted his grace. You didn't, you didn't try and negate the fact, oh, you can't forgive me. You don't know how bad I've been. No, you accepted it. You didn't question it. You just accepted it. It was easy to say no to things because you had this, this, this wonder, this love. You, you were able to say no because you experienced the weight, the magnitude, and the depth of his love. It was easy to say no to smoking. It was easy to say no to drinking. It was easy to say no to the things and the strongholds. It was easy not to curse because you had experienced his love love not his law his love his grace not his law you didn't even know the ten commandments when you first got saved but yet there was something because you experienced his love it gave you the ability to say no to day old chicken wings so you could say yes to eat from the bread of life where you'll never go hungry again you barely knew the word but yet you were able to resist temptation because you experienced his love, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, and his power. Does anybody understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? And then we grow up. And we forget what it was like to have that childlike faith. Because it's funny, because usually when we first get saved, we all become children. You can get saved in your 70s, and you can cry like a little baby. Come on, how many people, you got saved later on in life, but it was like you just had, it was almost like you became a child. Not in an intellectual way, not in a, not in a, in a, in a maturity way, but it was like you just, all of a sudden, you went from being skeptical to totally trusting overnight like that in a moment because of the grace of the Holy Spirit and the presence and the power of God. So... What happens is, just like Mickey was sitting on the edge of the bed with Rocky after he had the revealing of his statue in Philadelphia, and Clubber Lang, well, he accosted Rocky at his celebration. He talked to Adrian, and he said, hey, woman, hey, woman. Anyway, I won't go through the rest of the speech. <laughs> I bet you stay up real late. At anyway, I'm going to stop there. And at the edge of the bed, after 10 title defenses, Mickey said to Rocky, Rock, the worst thing that could have ever happened to a fighter happened to you. You got civilized. What do you mean, Mick? I ain't civilized. I'm a champ. You got civilized. Well, I have 10 title fans. They were has-beens. Anyway, end scene. Thank you very much. <laughs> the whole theme of Rocky Three, Eye of the... He lost... The hunger that he had as a contender, and he had gotten complacent as a champion. And as a Christian, it's funny we lose that hunger, don't we? We get civilized. 
we become Christians. We learn the rules of the game. We learn how to act in church. And especially if you grew up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s where you couldn't wear pants if you were a woman, where you couldn't wear makeup if you were a man. <laughs> Louis will tell you the drums were right where Steve and Melissa were sitting because the drums were evil and we're not a nightclub here at Belrose Assembly of God. And we, we hear the rules and the cadences, and then what do we do? We subconsciously think that this is who God is. And we lose the wonder, don't we? And it happens today. We think that God is the flesh. We think that God is skinny jeans. We think that God is the culture. And God is God. He is above the culture. He's above all things. Everything in him we live and move and have our being. God is God. And he's defined by his word. And he proves himself by his word. And yet we forget it because we become professional Christians. And then we try and work in our own righteousness. Isaiah 64, 6 in the NLT, it says, we are all infected and impure with sin. So look at somebody and say, hey, you infected and you contagious. And then look at somebody else, that's why I have the mask on. <laughs> we are all infected and impure with sin. So what that means is your righteousness can never, ever, ever get you right with God. When we display our righteous deeds... They are nothing but filthy rags. Like anyone, uh, like, any, like, like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the world, like the wind. You see, when we display our own righteous deeds, well, they are nothing but filthy rags. And so what happens is, you ever hear that scripture, they have, a, please don't get nervous. <laughs> this is all that's coming off. I got costume changes today. Have, have you ever heard the, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, you, you try and prove to God how righteous you are by Bible knowledge, by years in church, and, and we all fall victim to the gang culture. I've been in this church 15 years. I was the lead Sunday school teacher. I remember you when you first got saved. You know what that's saying? You'll never, ever get to the level I am because I got 15 years on you. But what they're really manifesting, I'm more childish than the kids in the nursery because I depend on my works. See, salvation through your works and what you've done in the past. Oh, look at this jacket. This jacket represents my past. When I was a freshman in high school, we all got the jacket. Look at the front. Here's the number right here. Matt will tell you. He saw me grow up in this jacket. This is it, number 30. Here's my position. It was on the other whatever it was. Smithtown football. I got my letter stored somewhere away where I can't even find it. So I should have put it on this jacket, but never did. I was a freshman, and all the football team had this jacket. And this jacket represents my accomplishments. I was 195 pounds. I was the MVP in the junior high school team. I came up to high school. I had all the promise in the world. I was this height when I was in ninth grade. That's why I was so sought after as a football player. Once I became a senior, and I was the same height, and my brother Joe, 6'1", walked into the football room with me, the coach said this to me, what are they feeding him at home that they're not feeding you? And this jacket represents my past accomplishments. It represents when I was in shape. It represents when I could run all day, where I could have two Big Macs, two large fries, two milkshakes, and an extra large Coke supersize me and still lose weight. Do you realize if I have one Big Mac, one Diet Coke, and a fry, I gain in five pounds overweight on my pinky toe? And this is what happens when many of us use our past accomplishments, it hurts me. It really hurts. Maybe there's been some weight gain. It's the COVID-19. Let me button this up so this way. And it's funny because this is how we come to God. Many of you will come to me and say, I did this in your name. And I did. Yeah, you can't even take me seriously. Stop it. And this is how stupid we look when we try and prove to God how righteous we are. 
Because our own righteousness, you could see, come on, how many people, you could see right through this. This is, this is how we look. And what we need to understand is that we have to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Ephesians 2, 1 and 5, it says in the Bible, in the NIV, and this is verses 4 and 5, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it's not by my deeds that I've been saved. It's by his grace. So what I want every one of you to do right now is to stop trying to prove to God why you deserve his love. Stop trying to prove to God why you're sorry and he's got to forgive you. And just accept, take off your righteousness right now. Hold on a second. <laughs> you go, show this to your husband. <laughs> Tell him I was the MVP in eighth grade, all right? And after a midget issue of stunted growth, you know, I did okay in football, but not as good as eighth grade. But I got the jacket. Take off your righteousness. Take off you trying to prove to God how much he should forgive you. And accept this scripture. I want you to look at it again. But because of his great love for us. Not because of what you've done. Because of his great love. Look at somebody and say this. Because of his great love. And God who is rich in mercy. You know what that means? His mercy is anew every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Rich in mercy. That means, that means mercy. That means that even when you fail, he has the capacity to forgive you. And empower you so you can live the life. You see, once again, how do you overcome sin? The first thing is you got to receive his love no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter who you are, no matter how many times you've failed. And it's funny because many of you may be thinking this is such an elementary lesson. Okay, then why is it you still got that habitual sin that you can't say no to? Why is it that you try and prove to God over and over again and you make those deals with him? God, if I can go four weeks, if I could go four weeks without doing it, saying it, thinking it, then, then you know what? Then, then I will feel forgiven. You know the word, but you don't apply the word. And the Bible says because of his love, we are not consumed. And God who is rich in mercy... He made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our own transgressions. Ready? Here we go. It is by grace you have been saved. It is by grace you have been saved. You know what that means? You could have done nothing to save yourself, and you can't do anything to heal yourself, and you can't will yourself away from the taquito. Come on, can somebody give God praise? Type it in online right now. It's by grace I have been saved. I want you to write this down because we forget it. Salvation and relationship with God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit is a gift. It is a gift. It is a gift that you don't deserve. It is a gift that you cannot pay for. It is, and it is a gift that you must receive regardless of your status, regardless of what you've done, and regardless of how you've been. It's a gift. And it's a gift that you continually, continually receive. The gift of his grace, the gift of his love, the gift of his Holy Spirit, the gift of his compassions, they fail not. And that's the problem. You became an adult and you forgot the joy of what it is to be a kid getting a gift. Come on. How many people love to see kids get gifts? How many people love to give gifts? I don't really want much for Christmas. I just want to see Rachel and the kids just open gifts. I got Rebecca. I'm telling you, there is no dad who knows the American girls like this dad. And she kept on telling me how she wanted... Courtney, 1986. And then she wanted the other one. Who's the other one? Joss. So I know she really loves the American dolls. Plus, I also know we can sell them for money once she gets over them. I make investments. And I got Courtney before Black Friday because I knew all those other crazy mothers would get her. And then she'd be backward, and then we wouldn't be getting her to. And I even got the matching pajamas. And with Joss, 
because I know about the American girls, I added the $18 for the ear piercing. <laughs> and on Christmas morning, she opens it up. Courtney 1986. That's all she thought she was getting. But I knew she also wanted Joss. And then she found out Joss was coming. And when she opened up Joss, she said, oh, it's Joss. I can't believe you got me Joss. And I said, and her ears are pierced. <laughs> Does she deserve two American dolls? No child does. Those things are, <sighs> I miss the boys. <laughs> Give Luke a bucket of wrestlers. He's happy. You know, give Dominic a Tasha Cobb CD. Yes, yes, we'll rise above. Her two American dolls, I'm declaring bankruptcy. <laughs> but I got the ears pierced. It's a gift. And you forgot what it was like to take the gift. You got so used to church that the gifts were there. And you forgot they were even for you. How many people you want to know, you want to have the wonder again. You want to know what it's like to experience the gift. Salvation is a gift. When was the last time you really thought you had a gift from God? And you looked at church service and worship as a task rather than a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift to be here this morning. It's a gift to be in this building this morning. It's a gift to be online this morning. It's a, it's a, it's a privilege to worship the Lord. Amen. And remember, you're not saved by what you do. You're saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to that because nobody lives it. Unfortunately, in the contemporary Christian church, we have, we have gravitated, whether we know it or not, even whether you theologically align with this or not, with a works that comes as a byproduct of our trying to prove to God. But once again, you can't prove to God how sorry you are. You can't prove to God how much you messed up. You can't prove to God anything. You just have to come just as you are. And you have to understand that you are not saved by your works and you are not kept in your salvation by your works. You are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And out of understanding his love and what he's done for you, then come your works. Simply put, when you first got saved, you would sign up for everything in the church. It wasn't a burden. You started to do works because the works came out of a genuine love relationship for the Lord. There's a reason I not only prep this food that I'm cooking for Peter, but after I was done prepping this food, and Andrew, of course... I cooked dinner for Rachel because I went to Ivorone for the best ingredients. She didn't say, I didn't go to Stop and Shop. I went to the Italian market, and I paid top dollar for everything on that table because I know who I'm cooking for. But why did I cook for Rachel? Not out of obligation, out of love. I was up till 4 o'clock in the morning between all the prep and the cooking, and I'm saying to myself, what the heck is wrong with you? Why are you doing this? You just could have preached. But why am I doing this? Because I love the Lord, and I believe there's an illustration that's going to come to you that you're never going to forget. The works of what we do, oh, yeah, get that. The works of what we do doesn't come out of obligation or trying to prove ourselves. It comes out of love for God. And unfortunately, in the church of Jesus Christ, is anybody hearing this this morning? We have gravitated to a faith that is justified by works. Now, faith without works is dead, but works is a byproduct of a genuine love relationship with God, not of trying to prove to him. You know, it's funny because one of the biggest things preachers have had to deal with this year is the fact that we had to preach to audiences of none. And we didn't get that validation. Great message, pastor. I would go home and it would be like flying blind. And you know what the Lord has revealed to me? It's funny because I never intended this, and I don't even think I, I, I consciously thought it. But preaching is not what feeds me. My preaching and my pastoring is what feeds God. And yet, how many times in the body of Christ is that this and what I do here or you and what you do there, it speaks to our insecurities and validates us rather than worships God. We do it in the name of God, 
We teach Sunday school in the name of God. We serve in the name of God. But ultimately, it feeds us, not him. It feeds our insecurities. It feeds our need to be recognized. It feeds our need to be affirmed. It feeds the need of affirmation that our parents never gave us or whatever the case is or however you grow up. And it's funny because we have a form of godliness, but we deny its power. Anything you do for you, it burns up in the fire, but only what you do for Jesus Christ will last. And what I do and why I stayed up till four in the morning and why I'm preaching this message has nothing to do with you and everything to do with him because if you are my source of validation, you will always dry up and you will not be there. But when God is my source of validation, when I do this as my act of worship, that's why scripture says everything we do, we do it for the glory of the Lord. Because how many people know the frustration when you do it for people and you don't get the credit that you uh, deserve? Come on, raise your hand. It happens at work. It happens. At... But when you do it for God, who cares what they say? As long as we good, I know I'm good. And that's the problem. The enemy has lulled us into this false sense of security. You cannot view Christ through a worldly point of view. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17 says this. From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though once we regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. See, the reason why we fall victim to works righteousness is because we, we, we gravitate to viewing Christ through the view of the world. We see Christ as an authority and a judge to whom we must prove that we are innocent in a court of law. Does that make sense? We have this view of Christ where we gravitate to God as we view our parents, as we view society. And we don't do this, we don't do this consciously. This happens subconsciously. And friends, it happens even more subconsciously because of social media. Because we are allowing many voices to come in and cloud the voice of the Holy Spirit. And so we have a view of God that is tainted by our worldview rather than our Bibles. Does that make sense? And 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17, it says, From now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. And then it goes on to say, therefore. Everybody say with me, therefore. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. <laughs> the old is gone and the new is here. All of this is from God. So now we're going to talk about the power to change. I want you to turn with me to second, uh, to Titus, the book of Titus, chapter 2, 11 through 14. Don't worry, Peter. Pure Ellen. Keeping myself pure for your chicken, Francais. It's coming. How many people are excited? We could possibly burn down the church today. If there is a fire, the exits are here, here, and here. And everybody just look for Al. He'll guide us out. Titus 2, 11 through 14. Now I want to read this to you, and then we're going to get over to this illustration. Is this blessing somebody today? You're all looking at me like, you got this, you're good, you're all free, you're all, you're all not trying to prove to God why he should forgive you. Receive his grace as a gift. And we obey God. See, what is, we love him. Because he first loved us. You're trying to do it the other way. We're getting him to love. We're trying to prove to him why he should love us because we want to be good enough to merit his love. You can't do that. We love him because he first loved us. Okay. The answer to everything that we're about to talk about is in the first verse that I'm going to read. Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no. Now, what teaches us to say no to pornography, sleeping around, lust, cursing, gossip, all of the strongholds that we can't say no to? Is it our merit? Is it our willpower? What does it say? It says this. It says the grace God has the, the, the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. 
It teaches us to say no, right? His grace, not, not, not more accountability groups, not read your Bible, although you should read your Bible, although we should have accountability, but here's the deal. It is not church structure or church culture or trying to reproduce somebody's behavior that is going to get you to say no to pornography, to sex outside of marriage, to lust, to cursing, to gossip, to greed, to selfishness, to envy, to deceit to alcoholism and drunkenness. It is not willing your way. It is the grace of God, which is a gift. And it's his grace. It's his grace that teaches us. His grace teaches us. His grace teaches us through the Holy Spirit that is in us, that takes the words of God and makes them known to us. Apart from him, you can do nothing. In my weakness, he makes me strong. Come on, can you say it? His grace is greater. Tap three people you know you live with so you don't give them COVID and say, his grace is greater. It teaches us to say no to all ungodliness and worldly passions and to leave and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope. How many people know Jesus is coming back? Amen. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up to redeem us for all wickedness and to purify himself, a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And see, for too long we have looked at be self-controlled, upright, live godly lives, all these things, and we think that we have to do it in our own strength. But Paul said, I prayed for this thing to be taken from me three times. And I prayed, and God still, God still kept me humble. And he says, it's, it's in this weakness that only God can make me strong. So therefore, I boast in my weakness. You can't. None of us, listen to me, none of us have the power to overcome pornography. None of us have the power to avoid an affair in our marriages. None of us have the power to live lives that reflect this word. None of us have the power to not curse. None of us have the power to not be envious. None of us have the power to not gossip. None of us have the power to resist any sin that you can think of, none of us, because that's relying on the football jacket. But when you are clothed, Pastor Kevin, in his righteousness, everybody give it up for Jesus. But when you are clothed in his righteousness, you're washed whiter than snow. Go get the next part, Pastor Kevin, a.k.a. Jesus. When you're clothed in his righteousness, the Bible says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand against the devil's schemes. That when you are clothed in his righteousness, how many people know, if I stood there in my football jacket, there's one more piece, PK. If I stand there in my football jacket and cook you that food, how many people know, I have no credibility. But his righteousness clothes me so that I am not only credible for the task in his power, I am equipped with the tools to do the ministry that he has called me to do. How many people know this looks a whole lot better, Pastor Kevin, if you will? Ooh, ooh you got the spot. Right there. For four years, I worked in the Epicurean restaurant. I started off as a dishwasher. And then I said to them the next year, I came, I said, listen, I don't want to wash dishes anymore. I said, I love it, but I said, I want to learn to cook because it was one of the passions of my life. I used to watch all the shows on PBS before the Food Network was around. Oh, and then when Emeril Lagasse came on, bam! 
And so for three and a half years, I learned how to cook from people who went to the Culinary Institute of America, worked at some of the top restaurants, and I started as a pantry chef, and then I went to a prep chef, and then I eventually in my last year got on the line. And I used to wear this to work every day. And I was able to use this gift to do missions banquets and different things of that nature. And so when I realize that I am clothed in his righteousness, I want you to write this down. His righteousness gives me the credibility and the anointing to do what he has called me to do. In this case, it gives me the power to say no to the junk. And let me remind you, two for four. And $185 to the gastroenterologist. It gives me the power to say no what will bring me temporary relief. To say yes, to not only be able to eat, but the Bible says the Holy Spirit will remind you of what I told you. And it's funny because one of the dishes in the Epicurean restaurant was chicken francais. You can get it at a banquet. But don't, because it's baked, and it ain't cool. You can get it in an Italian restaurant. Depends on which Italian restaurant you want to go to. Some are good, and some are bad. You could buy the sauce. But friends don't let friends buy jarred sauces. Or you can learn from somebody who did it over and over again how to cook it. And as I cook this, <laughs> he died on his sword. <laughs> and as you cook this, I'm going to teach you. So we're going to, you know, I'll, preach, I'll do the preaching part, but I also want to teach you. How many people you want to learn to make this dish? Because even if it says I have a own, this ain't it, baby. So we're going to heat up our pan. And what I'm relying on is what I learned over 20 plus years ago. Pastor Kevin, can you uh, please heat this up, make sure that it gets nice and hot, because I don't have more than one thing. Now, the first thing you need to understand about cooking, and by the way, all of the containers that we have are courtesy of Chef Wang's, everybody. <laughs> Had it not been for Chef Wang's, all right, so here we go. Now, I've got all the ingredients in their place, because once again, we're talking about overcoming the desire to compromise, okay? So I have all the ingredients in the place to make this chicken francais. I've got all my knives, I'm gonna put them here. Now, the French word for everything in its place, that means all of your ingredients is, anybody wanna take a stab? Mise en place, that's right, give yourself a hand. Mise en place means everything in place, okay? Now, Peter, here we go. I'm gonna make sure, gotta get the, okay, here we go. Here we go. Now we all sanitize. All right, so what you need is a, uh, is a hot pan. Preferably, you should cook with gas because gas is where it's at. Electric, this is an induction thing. It's okay if you're living in an apartment or whatever the case is, but this is what we got for today. Uh, but the biggest thing you need to understand is that when you cook anything, hot pan, cold oil. That's going to make sure we're good. All right, so you can see here, to make the chicken francais. I've got some flour, all right? Flour's got some salt in it, why? Because my flour doesn't come seasoned. I want to make sure it's nice and tasty. I got some kosher salt. Let's give it up for the house of David. Everybody say amen. I'm gonna make sure that that's nice and shaken up and we, that's already been prepared. Now, what I have in here as well, uh, let's see, I need my, my uh, forks. Where are my forks? We have my forks over here, here we go. Oh, behind Jeremiah, this is great. Aren't you glad everything is live? Oh, chef of the future. It's zipping. All right, gonna need some forks and stuff. 
So what I'm going to do is I've, I've taken about six or seven eggs, and I've whipped them up. Jeremiah, you want to see over here? This is your egg wash. All right? Now, how many people ever made a chicken cutlet? What do you do? Put it in the egg first, put it in the breadcrumbs second. We're going to do the reverse because we want to make a nice little skin around this chicken francais. It's almost going to be like we coated it in an omelet. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the breading first, and then we are going to do the chicken second, okay? So here we go. I've got these chicken cutlets that I had my friend at Ivorone cut for me. Everybody say, ooh and ah. And what I did was I put these between parchment paper. I took a pan and I beat them like they owed me money. Because you don't want your chicken to be tough. Nobody likes a tough chicken. You want a nice tender piece of chicken. You got to break down some of those fibers. So what I'm going to do with the chicken is I'm going to put it in the flour that I have seasoned. I did not put pepper in. Anybody know why I didn't put pepper in? Because it's going to, it's going to make the presentation look a little weird. It's going to put those pepper flakes in. You can put the pepper in there. I just got some salt. Very, you know, and over season the flour. And what I'm doing is I'm dredging this in the flour so it looks like this. Everybody see it looks like a Zeppeli. Or Scarface had his way. All right, anyway, the jokes are free, guys. I'm going to take it, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to shake off the flour. I'm going to put in the egg wash. I'm going to get it all nice. Now we're going to go for his friend, chicken cutlet number two. We're going to do the same thing. All right? Now, once again, I could eat this and totally ruin my digestive system because I bought these yesterday at 7 o'clock at night from 7-Eleven. The guy must have thought I was on a cocaine binge. I could eat these, but how many people know the power to say no is in the fact that you know something better? I could compromise and eat this and get some diria, or I can make this and we could do it. So I've dredged this, okay? All right, so ready, you get egg wash and flour. How simple is that? Wow, you're fired as an audience. All right, I got these things. Make them get nice and happy here. All right, very good. Now, what did I say? Hot pan, cold oil. We're going to put a little bit of oil in here because, oh, look at that smoking. So let's take it off right now. That's hot. Sit. You could always do this, everybody. Guys, if you think this is hot, hell is hotter. <laughs> All right. That's good. Now, here we go. I'm going to grab my chicken. Notice, here we go. Oh, yeah, we're cooking. We're cooking. We're cooking. All right, get this back up on the heat. And notice... I got a nice little, uh, little deal happening there with the chicken. All right, now, don't move it. Don't touch it. Didn't do anything to you. Let it get nice. We're cooking. This is time. Put on some music. Grab some Cherry Coke Zero. Make it happen. Now, what we're doing is this. We're going to brown it on one side. Now, while I'm cooking this, how many people know sometimes when temptation happens, oh, we got to wait. We got to wait. And, oh, man, I really, I really want this. This is going to give me immediate satisfaction. But when I think about the goodness of God, when I think about the mercy of God, when I think about how he has equipped me and empowered me with the full armor of God to say no to this and yes to this. So how many people know we are saved by grace? When I think about his grace, when I think about his love, when I think about his mercy. And I'm going to check it. Oh, I'm going to check it. All right. We got a little bit more to go. A little bit more to go. We're almost there. You don't want to burn it. What we're doing here is we'll put this over here. That's, that's no longer important to us. Uh, look at that. Look at that. Look at that nice little golden brown over here. Look at that. Look at that. I'm going I'm to cook it. Remember, because I got cutlets and I pounded them like they owed me money, I don't have to cook these that long. They're thin. If they were thick, I'd have to do it a little bit later. All right. Now, here we go. We want the other side to look like that side. Cameraman, get in in there. Burn that camera up. Let's do it. There you go. Look at that. Come on. Look at that. See, we got nice, it looks like an omelet. You know what I'm saying? Look, now, look, I'm, I'm going to do this. I don't like to move my food, but I'm just trying to make sure over here we're good. We want this to start to look to brown. Then what we're going to do is at this juncture, we're going to deglaze the pan with some white wine. Now, for those of you religious people that are all upset that I got white wine in the church, well, you have it in your house, so what's up with that? Why am I not using cooking wine? 
I'm going to cook the alcohol out first of all. I do not drink, but I do not use cooking wine. Why am I not using cooking wine? Because cooking wine comes with too much salt in it. You cannot control the salt. All right, you notice that that alcohol is just about evaporated. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some chicken stock in here. All right, we're building the sauce that's going to make the Francais. Because remember, friends, don't let friends buy jarred sauce. Why buy the jar when you can make it on your own? Now, the elements are you got a white wine, you got a Chablis, all right, right here. I don't drink it. I just cook with it. The rest of you hyper-religious people, I'm coming to your house to see where you got your vodka. All right. Now, we got some lemon juice. Remember, I could always add more. I'm going to ask you a question. What do chefs do? What do chefs do? They taste their food. That's why I got some spoons. Remember, oh, I'm so hungry, I want this, but look at this. How many people, you'd rather have this right now than this? This will get some, you, you're wrong if you want this, Josh. Don't, don't sway the people. Let, let me hold it up. I didn't even refrigerate. You want this or this? Why are you not saying this? You are totally ruining the illustration. All right, how am I going to thicken the sauce? <laughs> butter! <laughs> yeah, get that bad boy in there. We're going to let the butter make nice, nice with our sauce. Look at that. Come on. Everybody, everything is better with butter. You all look like you're upset that I just put butter in here. I'm going to get that all squared away. Pastor Kevin, can you hit those, uh, those green beans? Now, while I let this get a little nice, nice. We're going to prepare for the dish because, you know, we got to show you got some cooking skills over here. Going to finish it off with uh, a nice little lemon. Going to take the paring knife and cut off a little bit of this. There we go. Nice little lemon slice. Nice and thin. Come on, look how thin that is. You can see through it. Going to make a little slit over here. Boom. There's part of my garnish. Now I got some wonderful heirloom tomatoes. Over here, come on, everybody, give it up for heirloom tomatoes. Look at this. Come on, cameraman. Look at how nice these are. I'm going to take the paring knife. We're going to cut these in four. These have been washed. All right, so I'm going to make some nice little cuts. Look at that. You know what? Because food is appealing. How many people know we eat with our eyes? You don't eat with your eyes? I eat with my hands. All right. I think we're good. We're almost there. Now, remember, chefs taste things. So before I give it to Pete and Andrew. Oh, yeah. We're good. I think I put too much salt in there, but that's all right. I got excited. <laughs> Let me get some of this. All right. All right. Let's get the plate for presentation. Where's my stuff? Guys? What do we got? We need a plate. Give me a plate. Somebody give me a plate right over there. Yeah, that's just, let's do it on a big plate, because then we can justify charging $28.95. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Pastor Kevin, do we have the, uh, the green beans, which I did last night? Look at these green beans roasted with uh, some garlic. Come on, look at that right there. Did those fresh. I'm going to put these right here and make them nice. Remember, we eat with our eyes and our hands. All right, Pastor Kevin, we got that here. We're going to put our chicken like this. Look at that. Look at that. Come on, look at that caramelization right there. Woo! Put that sauce right over there. Woo! Now we're going to bring it over. We've got our lemon wedge. Mm. And then I'll take a couple of sprigs of Italian parsley. I'll put it right here. And you know what? I don't believe in going back to the 90s in the culinary scene. But just because I love emerald, I'm going to chop you some parsley. I'm going to get it on the plate. Oh, yeah. It's chopping. Mm. What do you think happens in the restaurant? 
while you're eating. And even though I don't believe in putting parsley on a plate because it's not 1994, for Emerald Lagasse, here we go, everybody say it. One, two, three, bam! $24.95. Look at that. Look at that. Come on. Look at that. Here's Jesus behind me. This represents any sin, the temptation to put our trust in our works is a sin. And when I'm clothed in his righteousness, when I'm empowered by his Holy Spirit, and I realize what he empowers me to do, and that through his knowledge, what was I able to do? I was able to recall my knowledge of four years working in a restaurant to cook you this dish. The Holy Spirit will bring the word of God to you and make you realize that gossip is nothing compared to the blessing of Jesus Christ. The sex before marriage, sex before marriage, good things come to those. This is sex outside of marriage. Let me, it's not the right shape to even do that. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is sex in marriage. How many married people know it's much better inside marriage? This is chasing our dreams. This is living for God's dream. And when you do that, not only table number 17, please, Pastor Kevin. <laughs> not only, what's that? Table 17, the... Uh, the critics over there. <laughs> if it's too much or not enough, I'll do another one for you. Realize I did this in front of people. <laughs> but when you are clothed in his righteousness, don't look at what they're doing. <laughs> Peter's like, <"Bleh." laughs> Is it all right? Would you, would you get it in a restaurant? Is that, are you happy? All right, I'm not going to ask because she's looking at it strange. Do you want this? But what I'm saying is when you're clothed in his righteousness and you're empowered by his spirit and you understand his grace and his love and then you realize he gives you the strength not only to say no, but to make something better. It's easy to say no to this. It's easy to say no to this. And it's easy to say no to this. Even when they look hot. I know, right? Some of you are like, I said no to that before you even took it out. <laughs> no wonder this was two for four. But how many people know that sometimes it looks better? And it smells better. It'll bring you temporary joy, but it'll burn up. And it'll burn you up. Every one of us, God has given us the ability to not only eat better, but live better. Because you're not clothed. In the old you. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. And realize this. <laughs> when you are clothed in his righteousness, you are qualified to do the task that he has called you to do. Not in my strength but in his strength.